Good afternoon, everybody. We'll give uh, people some time, a couple of minutes or so, just to to uh, for people to join, and then and then we'll kick off um, uh, this event. So let's just give it a minute or so for people to join. Okay. Um, good afternoon to everybody. I think we'll we will start. We have a, a lot to to get through in the next hour and a half. Uh, my name is Richard Kozel Wright. I'm the director of the Division on Globalization and Development Strategies here in UNCTAD, and it's a it's a real pleasure for me to uh, moderate um, this uh, session and and the launch of a book. Not just because. Uh, it's nice to highlight the contribution of old colleagues, which it's always nice to do, but, but because the work I think we're going to talk about today is incredibly closely tied to the work that we do here in, 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 in UNCTAD and speaks to a lot of the, the, the key issues that we are uh, concerned with. Uh, it's, it is, it's a kind of irony of this highly financialized world that we that we've seen emerge over the last uh, three or four decades, that the rise of licit flows, so-called legal flows, uh, driven by market forces and, and couched in the kind of language of, of transparency and good governance and the rule of law has coincided with a huge surge in what people referred to as illicit uh, financial Flows and, and developing countries in particular have been caught up in this with the, the resulting loss of, 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 of resources being a long-standing complaint of policymakers in the South. And the more so, the greater the demands uh, on, on government budgets due to expanding uh, mandates, due to the uh, demands of the international community with development challenges, the sustainable development goals with, with the growing concerns around, around the climate challenge and, and the pressures and the squeezing that that has caused is a, is an, is a complaint that we hear uh, constantly from, from our uh, membership and, and, and from uh, policymakers in the South. And, and of course, it's, I think it's very important to say from the outset that it's not simply the, the challenge around illicit financial flows it's not simply about criminal activity by state actors, although there is, of course, criminal activity by state actors, uh, but it's, it's about kind of predatory and rent-seeking behavior by private actors, and including very large international firms and the network of supporting institutions that they draw upon to hide their profits and, and, and shift resources around the global economy, which works for them, but doesn't work for uh, developing countries and policymakers in the South. And, and UNCTAD is paying more and more attention, of course, to the, the policy challenge posed by illicit financial flows uh, and the need, particularly for an un, uh, a multilateral response to this challenge. Uh, uh, for all kinds of reasons, many developing countries cannot solve this problem by themselves, they need the support of the international uh, community. UNCTAD 15, our, our quadrennial conference, uh, which took place uh, at the end of last year in Bar Barbados, uh, singled out illicit financial flows as a, as a particular challenge that we need to focus on more dil diligently. And that, that includes statistical work. We are working with the UN uh, Office of Drugs and Crime on, on trying to improve the data collection around illicit financial flows. But of course, it in, includes important um, analytical work that we do in my division, but other uh, parts of uh, UNCTAD are doing important work also on the challenge this poses and the kinds of prescriptions that we need uh, to deal with it. So with that in mind, it's a, it's a real 
pleasure to to introduce um, uh, the book that we're going to talk about, and, and I'm very much looking forward to the the presentations that we have from I th two or perhaps three authors. One of the authors is caught up, un unfortunately, with the with the COVID uh, crisis and, and, and is trying to make it. He may not, but we have two of the editors of the book. Um, and so it's a real great uh, pleasure to, to welcome them uh, to this meeting. We also have a number of uh, eminent discussants who, who will, will talk about the findings of the book and, and, its, and, and its relevance to the policy challenges that, that they face. Um, I will introduce them. Uh, uh, one by one. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with introductions. You can find everyone's CV or biography on the on the UNCTAD uh, website um, so, uh, for those that want to, to, to have more information. And I should remind everybody that we will have some time at the end for Q&A. And so if you do have questions or comments, please post them uh, in the chat and we'll pick up as many as we can in the, in the time remaining. Um, so we will we will kick off uh, with uh, the presentations by um, uh, the co the co authors or co editors of the book um, Leons and Dikumana, who is a professor at the University of Massachusetts and has a very distinguished career and and, and has published extensively on on development challenges, uh, particularly in Africa um, and. Uh, uh, interesting for us, of course, has a very um, honorable UN pedigree as well. He was at the Economic Commission for Africa uh, and is currently a member of the United Nations Committee for Development Policy. And I think, I think before you joined the UN, you were also at the African Development Bank, if I remember, Leonce as well. Um, and and uh, uh, Leonce's colleague, Jim Boyce, um, who is also a professor at the University of uh, UMass Amherst. I have nostalgic connections there. I think, I think you joined Jim just as I left UMass, finished my, I think that's my, right. M, yeah. my MPhil there. So it's, it's always nice to reconnect. Um, and has worked for many years on a, a wide array of, of development uh, policy challenges, and more recently on, and again, work that overlaps with UNCTAD, of course, on the climate crisis and the, the challenges that that poses for policymakers in both developed and developing countries. Um, I'm not going to go through either of their extensive bibliographies. People who are interested can, can read them, but it's a great pleasure to welcome both of you. Um, I guess, uh, Leonce, you will kick off of uh, 15 minutes or so by way of uh, your presentation. Yes. Um, good. Uh, the, share the screen. Can everybody see my screen? All right, perfect. Uh, good morning. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this, uh, the launch of uh, our book uh, on uh, the trail of capital flight from Africa, the takers and the enablers. This is a, a joint effort by a team of uh, experts. Um, the list of authors include Adam Abubekar, South African, <laughs> Melvin Ayogu from Nigeria, Jim Boyce, who is presenting today, Jamer Kar <clears throat> from France, and Carmen Naidu from South Africa also, and myself. Uh, this, uh, this was a true uh, teamwork. Uh, we also uh, benefited from uh, generous uh, support from various institutions and, and, and people. Uh, the Open Society Foundations, uh, provided a generous grant for the project. Also the Frederick Ed Ebert Stifford, um, Stifford uh, in Berlin uh, produced also funding for travel and conferences. 
the Political Economy Research Institute at, at UMass has provided a lo uh, lot of support, both financial and uh, logistical support. We benefited immensely from uh, assistance from experts in the countries uh, and, and government officials through discussions uh, that have helped us to get some insights and data. We greatly appreciate the, uh, the help of uh, the support of ANTAD for hosting this book launch. I want to reiterate the, the words of uh, our colleague Richard that ANTAD takes this uh, work on capital flight, illicit financial flows uh, very seriously because it, it fits in, 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 the, in its agenda on development financing and promoting uh, development in, uh, in the world. I want to remind people also that ANTAD has, has published a, a, a critical reports on, on capital flight, these financial flows. I think last year they had a, 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 a big report on these financial flows through trade misinvoicing. Uh, that's, uh, that's very much appreciated. Um, uh, we're talking about uh, capital flight in the context of a, of a world where the continent of Africa is rising from our tends to used to be called the continent on the blink to a continent on the rise, but we wonder what to whom and for whom the Africa is rising because we see stubbornly high poverty rates, unemployment, especially youth unemployment, high infant mortality and inequality. And we think that this is a result of the shortage of development financing, which is a constraint to accelerating growth and sustainability of growth in Africa. So, um, we believe that capital flight is severely undermining the efforts that governments in Africa are, are undertaking to mobilize the development resources, development financing, and the situation has been worsened by the COVID pandemic and the economic crisis, and therefore it's even more urgent to tackle the problem of, of capital flight. Just to give you a, a sense of what, how we came, we came to, to this, uh, this work, we started out, I started this work with Jim uh, in, in the late 90s. Jim has started two centuries before that. Uh, we were working on the case of the Congo. We were amazed by how much money had fled the Congo and especially how much money the uh, P Mobutu and people behind, behind around him had amassed uh, from capital flight many times uh, through, uh, I want to, uh, how do I want to remove? I hope you don't see the list of, of participants that I see on my screen. Um, but uh, we realized that this problem was not limited to the Congo. It was um, a general problem. We, when we investigated the uh, uh, majority of African countries, we find that the continent was ironically, as we, as we stated, a net creditor to the rest of the world in the sense that more resources were coming out of the continent than, than, than was coming in. And we find that one of the big channels of funding of capital flight was external borrowing, which was being embezzled by those people who were in, in charge of managing the money. Then we now have decided to go at the micro level to look at, at more disaggregated analysis at the country level, at the sector level to, under, to uncover the mechanisms and institutional economic mechanism of capital flight, and also look at uh, the global context of capital flight. And we uncovered this were global network of enablers that facilitate uh, capital flight and the hiding of, uh, of uh, stolen resources from Africa. We are happy to, to, to note that uh, policymakers have, pay, have taken a note. In the case of Africa, there is a high level panel of illicit financial, on illicit financial flows from Africa that's facilitating the debate and the analysis of capital flight. That's uh, very much uh, welcome. We are glad to see that the UN has taken on the issue of capital flight by um, adopting a resolution to com combat illicit, illicit financial flows. This is target 1644. The OECD is making a lot of efforts to tackle the, case, uh, the issue of, of corporate tax evasion, which is one of the motivations of capital flight. Yeah, and then the, also the IMF is pushing for global partnership in fiscal reforms. In fact, this morning I, I, I listened partly to a, uh, a meeting on this, this very same topic. So I think people are, are paying attention and it's very, very good to see. Um, uh, so what we mean by capital flight is basically the unrecorded outflows of, of funds from, from, from countries, uh, money that has come in the country that cannot be traced in the way it has been used. 
but we understand also that we want to underscore the fact that when money leaves the country, it gets accumulated as private offshore wealth and in multiple values uh, of, of the initial outflow. So the country loses not just the in initial flows, but it loses also the, the earnings from, uh, that could have been uh, accumulated from those, from those flows, which beca become private wealth held offshores, offshore. Um, so why do we care about capital flight and who should care? Of course, for Africa, it's a, it's a, it's a drain of, on, on resources. It, in, the, in the fact that uh, those resources could have been invested, that wealth could have been taxed, but also it depends in the quality in the sense that those benefit from capital flight are the elite and who are already uh, rich, whereas the poor are further deprived because that money is not uh, financing private uh, public service uh, uh, like health and education. It also erodes the, the institutions and the law and the morality and the ethics. And it's also an, an indictment, an indictment on, the, on the capacity of the government to rein in capital flight and regulate the economy. For destination countries also, they are taking note that illicit financial flows are bad for their economies. Uh, they inflate real estate prices. They actually act a, a mechanism of, of globalizing corruption and financial crime. For donor countries, they better pay attention to the issue of capital flight because it actually undermines aid effectiveness because we are not sure that the aid that goes into the country is uh, uh, contributing to, de to development unless it is well used to finance the projects that has been uh, requested for. If aid ends up uh, financing capital flight, the same as external borrowing, we have this issue of odious debt and revolving door of, uh, of, uh, of capital flight. The numbers are staggering. When we examine the case, uh, the, the estimates of capital flight from Africa, we find that African, uh, African countries have lost more, more money through capital flight than have received in, in official development aid, in remittances. Over the past, uh, from 1970 to 2008, we find that the continent has, has lost two trillion, over $2 trillion through capital flight. That's more than the, the, the combined GDP of all, of all countries. And on average, annual, annually, the continent loses about $60, million, uh, $60 billion of, uh, in, through capital flight. So uh, we want now to go into the, uh, we wanted to, to look at the details of capital flight by looking at the, at the case studies. What we, we do is basically going from the forest to the trees, and we chose in this book, in this case, to look at three countries, um, the Angola, Cote d'Ivoire, and South Africa, to be able to look at the detailed mechanisms of capital flight and look at the role of regulatory and institutional uh, inst institutions in, the, in driving capital flight. We want to look at the role of, of state institutions and not only the central government, but also uh, state-owned enterprises. We look at the role of resources, and we, as I will, as I will show uh, later, that capital flight is basically a perpetuation of the resource plunder that started way back before colonization of the continent. Uh, so the, th the three countries that we look at are tied by a legacy of underperforming relative to their potential. Angola is a leading oil producer, but today, if you look at the numbers, about 50% 50, 50 of the people live before, below poverty. If you, if you live in, in Luanda, it's, I'm told it's one of the most expensive country, uh, uh, town to live in because there is wealth that, that co coexisting with, with poverty. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire is one of the top producers of, of cocoa, but the cocoa growers remain poor. They live in poverty. South Africa is, is probably one of the most industrialized countries in the continent. It has vast amounts of resources. Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's ironically uh, no, uh, has been referred to as one of the most unethical, uh, unequal country. It's probably not absolutely the most un uh, unequal country, but, it, but inequality is very, very high in that country. And now we have been seeing uh, the story of state capture where uh, private uh, individuals and enterprises have penetrated those state institutions and have, have, have really handicapped the functioning of the state and its, its enterprises, and how this has only uh, facilitated accumulation of, of private wealth. Um, so 
the, on the three countries, the evidence is clear that there is a huge amount of capital flight that has flown through those countries. For Angola, over $100 billion from 1986 to 2008, on average, $4.2 billion. This is about half the amount, uh, twice the amount of money spent on health, which means that the country could more than double the uh, spending on, on health if they could keep that money in the continent. For Cote d'Ivoire, $55 billion have left the country and accounted for, on average, $1.1. billion. It's, 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 uh, if, again, if that money could have kept in, in the country, they could double the, the, the spending on, on health. For South Africa, $329 billion for the countries from 1970 to 2008. On average, 6, 50, about $16 billion from 2000 to 2008 annually. And that is about half the amount of money that's spent on public health. Uh, it's, this says that this amount of money is large, both in absolute um, uh, values, but also in terms of what the country could do if they could keep the money in the country to promote development. So for Angola, the, when if uh, um, uh, Nick gets a chance to, to come here, I will tell you the story about a country that has witnessed the plunder of its oil resources by a combination of political elite, uh, corporations, domestic and foreign, and state monopoly as a vehicle for enrichment of the elite uh, through uh, 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 embezzlement of the oil, oil exports, uh, through uh, oil back loans that benefit uh, foreign investors. And the case of Angola also shows that capital flight is a global phenomenon because it, show, it, it establishes the linkages between domestic agents and foreign, foreign agents, including banks that are, that are bankrolling the, uh, the, the businesses of private agents and offshore financial agents that are facilitating the transfer of wealth and the concealment, concealment of wealth. Uh, in the case of, the, of, of Ivory Coast, we, the book uh, focuses on the, on, the, on the cocoa sector, which is a big, a big part of the, 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 the uh, Ivorian economy. But when you look at the, who benefits from cocoa, it's a dismaying, really embarrassing to see that the producers get only 4% of the global value of the products from, from cocoa. And the big part goes to corporations that are in charge of processing and trading. That's why the, the, the cocoa producers remain poor while the economic and political elite and the corporations um, accumulate wealth in, in, in uh, both in the country and, and, and abroad. Again, that's, that's what I have, I have just explained. In the case of South Africa, one, um, uh, one uh, key evidence that we find is the, the role of trade misinvoicing, especially export misinvoicing of commodities as a key vehicle for uh, capital flight. Uh, the numbers don't, don't add up. There is a huge gap between what the country is declaring as exports and what the partners are declaring as import. The, the governments in the successive governments in, uh, in South Africa have, have really been um, worried about issues of capital flight and uh, they have implemented massive economic reforms, including tax amnesties to try to bring back the hidden, the hidden uh, offshore wealth. But the, 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 the success has been very, very limited. I think they, they, they continue to do that. Um, as I said, there is, has been uh, stories of, cap of state capture where private agents penetrate the state institutions to accumulate, to facilitate their own, the accumulation of their own wealth. The, the most known story is the story of the, the Gupta family, which we pro profile in the, in, the, in the book. State owned enterprises have been becoming mere cows for people to, to get rich. And at the same time, these, these state uh, enterprises are suffering uh, massive mismanagement. Some of them are the blink of bankruptcy, they are misfunctioning. Uh, and this is because of a network of enablers that facilitate corruption, state capture, and capital flight. Uh, we have um, a chart in the book that you, when you look at it, you get, it's dizzy, you get uh, amazed by the, the, the intricate uh, connections between private individuals, state, in, state um, uh, officials, and domestic and foreign banks, uh, corporations, 
uh, that are facilitating the, the, the capture of wealth and the transfer of wealth abroad. In the, in, at the end, the private uh, operators get richer while the, 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 the population uh, sees less uh, public services in terms of health and, uh, and education. So uh, we see capital flight as a continuation of the plunder of African resources that started in, in, in the colonial era. During the pre-colonial era and the colonial era, it was, the plunder was made by state, Western uh, states, but and also state men like the, the Belgian King Leopold who, who, who was purging the Congo's mineral resources and its people. In the modern era, the plunder is orchestrated by a network of global uh, actors uh, that are facilitating and enabling uh, the transfer of wealth from Africa to the rest of the world in offshore financial uh, uh, centers. These include kleptocrats, politically connected individuals, transnational corporations that are engaging in tax evasion and money laundering, bankers that bank on secrecy to help launder the dirty money and hide illicit, illicitly transferred wealth abroad, law firms, accounting firms, and consulting firms that, that help in creating shell corporation, delinking money, dirty money from the predicate, predicate crime and the beneficial owners, and tax havens that are leveraging rents from secrecy. Um, so the nexus between the plunder and capital flight is not purely, now this thing is, uh, uh, is not purely an internal problem of African countries, nor is it purely an, an international relationship in which an imperial power preys on faraway lands as in earlier centuries, like during colonization. Rather, it is a transnational phenomenon that spans national boundaries operated by a network of individuals and institutions who are bound together by mutual benefits and convenient, convenience regardless of nationalities. So if um, Nick makes it and join us, he's going to talk, talk to us about more about Angola. Uh, and uh, Jim is going to, to present more analysis and gives us some thoughts about what can be done to tackle this problem of capital flight. Uh, over to you, Jim, or Nick, if he's here. Um, okay, well, I gather that Nick is not here. So let me let me uh, begin, and uh, hopefully he'll be able to join us later. If you didn't hear at the beginning, our author uh, Nicholas Shackson, who wrote the chapter on Angola in the book, um, uh, is got some health issues going on and, and may not be able to make it today. Um, as uh, Richard uh, said in his generous uh, introduction uh, to today's uh, book launch. Um, the problem of capital flight is not uh, solely a problem of um, corrupt actors looting uh, state resources. Um, rather, it is a transnational phenomenon, as Leon's just said in his concluding slide. Transnational finance plays a key role in enabling uh, corrupt regimes to flourish. And in country after country, in Africa and elsewhere in the world, transnational plunder networks have manipulated states and markets alike in order to extract wealth and stash it far from prying eyes. Broadly, there are two ways to attack the problem of dirty money, of uh, stemming this uh, flow of dirty money uh, to offshore havens. The first is an after the fact piecemeal approach that targets individuals whose transgressions have moved the authorities to act. We see this happening now with the implementation of, um, of policies by the US, the UK and the EU with regard to assets of oligarchs uh, from uh, Russia in their, um, in their economies. Um, there are two problems with that approach. The first is that finding concealed assets is time consuming and costly. Uh, and such efforts to freeze assets or recover them when it can be proven that they've been stolen is uh, rarely successful in recapturing more than a small fraction 
of the ill-gotten gains. The second problem is that when we find ourselves uh, engaged in these searches for uh, hidden ill-gotten gains in uh, Western economies, we ought to ask ourselves, how did this money get there in the first place? And how much more of it is there? Who's benefiting from those inflows of assets from overseas? And who's being harmed? Not only the people overseas who are the victims of the misrule of those who are looting their countries, but also people in the recipient countries, in the Western economies who are adversely affected by these inflows. Um, our colleague, Nick Shaxson, um, has a book, a recent book that I want to just uh, flag for you called The Finance Curse, which looks especially at the adverse impacts in the destination countries, in economies like those of my own country, the United States or the United Kingdom, which are major uh, recipients of ill-gotten money from around the world. Uh, in fact, the U.S. now is becoming so important as an offshore uh, center for uh, hiding assets that it complaints are being made from traditional uh, offshore centers, uh, you know, tropical islands and so on, that they're losing business uh, to the United States and specifically to certain states like South Dakota is, is now number one, which have um, really set up business as purveyors of uh, secrecy for the hiding of assets abroad. Um, this phenomenon of laundering a money, hiding, helping to hide money in the Western economies, um, not only harms the people of the countries that are being uh, looted, as I mentioned, but also uh, has a number of adverse effects in the Western economies themselves. For example, as the chapter in Angola in our book uh, documents, one of the um, effects of the engagement of um, uh, one of the major banks in Portugal at the time, Banco Espiritu Santo, one of the effects of their malpractices around the world, uh, including uh, quite significantly in Angola, was that uh, they ended up having a, a collapse that set shockwaves through the European financial system back um, in 2014. Um, those uh, ripples of financial instability are not confined to the countries that are the sources of the ill-gotten gains they ripple through the economies of the destination countries, uh, causing a lot of problems in the process. A second example that we discuss in the book in, um, in one of the opening chapters by Leonce and myself is the effect that the hiding of uh, ill-gotten gains in real estate, in, uh, real estate purchases, particularly luxury real estate purchases, particularly in metropolitan centers like New York and London and Paris, for example, plays a major role in driving up real estate prices, inflating real estate prices to the point that local residents can't afford to uh, uh, procure housing in their own cities. This is a major adverse effect. A New York Times investigation conducted in 2015 found that in Manhattan, uh, over half, over half of all purchases of high-end uh, residential real estate went to anonymous owners operating through uh, shell corporations. This is an outrageous situation and one that it's the responsibility of countries, again, like my own uh, and other Western economies uh, to call a halt to. Why don't they do it? Why are, are these um, the rules so weak, the enforcement of those rules so lax and uh, the loopholes so widely exploited to allow this inflow of external money to continue. I think for that, we have to understand the political economy in the recipient countries, which is that uh, you've got powerful actors in banks, uh, financial institutions particularly, but also accountancy firms, uh, consulting firms, uh, real estate brokers, et cetera, who lobby ferociously to protect their interests, which are to be able to slice off a share of the loot 
uh, reward themselves rather handsomely for the secrecy services that they provide. So time and again, you see battles undertaken where the public and, and courageous uh, legislators are pressing for actions to, uh, to uh, stem the inflow of dirty money. You see lobbying against uh, those actions or to weaken them quietly by the uh, industry of enablers. This is part of the way that transnational plunder networks operate. They operate by blurring the boundaries between private activity for personal gain and public policy. And they do this not only in the countries that are the victims of looting, but also in the countries where the assets are stashed abroad, including again, my own. So in conclusion, because uh, we want to open it up to our, our distinguished panel of discussants and hopefully have some time for questions and answers at the end as well. Um, what can be done? What should be done? Well, in the destination countries, in the Western economies, I think broadly there are three strategies for dealing with this problem. The first is to enforce the existing rules. We've got some rules on the book. The rules have been getting tougher over the years. Some progress has been made, but there's a difference between having rules on the book and rules that are actually enforced. Rules that are on the book and not enforced are merely statements of good intentions. Um, so for example, the Financial Intelligence Unit in the United States, FinCEN it's called, it's part of the Treasury Department, is woefully underfunded. Um, totally uh, unable to follow up on the suspicious activity reports, for example, that are required uh, of banks to be filed with uh, FinCEN whenever uh, deposits uh, come in that are suspicious in terms of the quantities and origins of the money. Uh, the banks are off the hook once they file the suspicious activity report, and then they go and merrily do their business, and FinCEN doesn't follow up. The total budget for FinCEN is about the same as the total budget for the Financial Institution uh, Intelligence Unit in Australia, despite the fact that the United States is a vastly bigger economy with a vastly bigger financial sector. That's a disgrace, and it's one of the things that needs to be fixed. Adequate resources need to be provided to enforce the existing rules. Second thing that needs to happen is to close loopholes. For example, in US law, uh, sales of real estate, uh, of luxury goods, um, uh, investments in trusts, uh, hedge funds, private equity, all of that is wide open to anonymous money. There are rules about uh, what can be deposited into banks now, but these other vast sectors are con continue to be wide open to anonymous money flowing in. It's ridiculous that those loopholes would still exist. They need to be closed. And finally, the third thing that I think needs to be done is to widen the net, to take down the enablers, to go after the um, players in the international financial system who enable the looting uh, and plunder of uh, economies like those of Angola, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, South Africa. Uh, that includes going after bankers, going after lawyers, going after accountancy and consultancy firms. The fines for enabling uh, th these crimes um, should be big enough uh, and meaningful enough to actually deter complicity in collusion in the commission of those crimes. They shouldn't be slaps on the wrist. They should be big enough that these institutions don't even want to think about uh, violating the laws uh, by uh, facilitating inflows of dirty money. And the penalties ought to apply to individuals as well as institutions so that they personally can't escape consequences for their actions by hiding behind the veil of corporate ownership. So that means penalties should not only be financial, but in appropriate cases of criminal misconduct should involve prison sentences as well. I think we need to crack down on this problem. And it's an international problem, a transnational problem that pits the vast majority of the people of the world in developing countries and developed countries alike against the interests of a small but powerful group of actors who work together in these transnational plunder networks to benefit themselves at the expense of everyone else. I'll leave it there and I look forward to the discussion.
Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jim. Thanks, Leon. Before we do that, I mean, there is a question that kind of follows on from from what you said, Jim, about whether we can actually trace where the money is going. I mean, this is a huge problem. I, Leon's mentioned um, uh, Target 16.4 in the SDG agenda, where UNCTAD is is responsible, one of the agencies responsible for for uh, um, uh, establishing and monitoring that target. I mean, is there anything, do, do you have any in the book or in, in terms of trying to trace the flow, the flows back to, to who, are, where the beneficiaries, I mean, a lot of it must be in tax havens, I guess, and Nick has done a lot of work on that, but is there anything you can cast, shine some light on that issue? Well, as I mentioned, I mean, that's one of the strategies for dealing with the problem. It's the after the fact piecemeal strategy where you go after dirty money that has uh, found its way into safe havens abroad. Um, I believe that that's not a waste of time. It's an important thing to do. In some cases, significant amounts of assets are recovered. I mean, a lot of the money that General Abacha stole from Nigeria, for example, got recovered. Some of the money that Ferdinand Marcos stole from the Philippines got recovered, etc. But as I said, it's only a small fraction of the money that actually gets recovered in these stolen asset recovery initiatives. And it's a time consuming and costly process, right? So um, I think it's important to pursue those things, partly for the demonstration effect, partly to illuminate in, in, in the minds of the public um, the tip of the iceberg in terms of the scale of this problem. But what it also does is it points to the underlying question. Rather than wait until the crimes have been committed and uh, then belatedly go after those who have helped to enable them, why not start uh, preemptively in an across the board fashion, dealing with the systematic vulnerabilities in our international financial architecture that make it possible for this kind of looting to take place. That's what I think really requires coordinated international action. And that's the central message of our book, that this is not a matter of a few bad actors. These are systematic problems that involve transnational networks that are operating really in, in either the shadows entirely, in other words, in the illegal terrain, or in gray areas where the boundary between what's legal and what's illegal has been blurred, partly because of the political influence exerted by these plunder networks themselves. So that's the problem, right? It's a problem that is poorly recognized, I have to add, by most economists, speaking as an economist, you know? Economists are trained uh, in, a, in an imaginary world where property rights are perfectly secure and the only way you can make money is by being uh, productive and uh, generating profits by doing something that adds value to the world economy. That's the textbook model of, that's why greed is supposed to be a good thing, you know, and Adam Smith's invisible hand and all of that. Well, guess what? There's another part of the economy as well. Another way that wealth is, economy, is accumulated, another way that greed is expressed. And that's not by producing things, it's by taking things, it's by plundering. Uh, and that's been a big part of the world economy for a very long time. And Unfortunately, it still continues, just not in quite as blatant a form as it did back in the bad old days of colonial rule. Jim, thanks. Uh, I'm not going to try and defend my profession. I <laughs> no, no. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm I have an honorable exemption from that uh, gross I'm, generalization. I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, go on to our discussions because we have also some some great discussions. It's a great pleasure to welcome them. Um, we will start with Ambassador da Silva Izata, who is the uh, permanent representative of Angola to the UN in, in Geneva and has a, a very distinguished career focusing on multilateral affairs in, in Lusaka, in New York, in Geneva. I, I, again, the CV is on, on, on our website and, and, and uh, I don't want to spend time going, going through it in, in, in detail, but it's a, it's a great pleasure to have you, Ambassador, and to listen to your comments.
Um, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me. Okay. Uh, Director Kosuhait of UNCTAD, distinguished professors Leonce Ndikumana and James Boyce of the University of Massachusetts, Excellencies, Angola thanks UNCTAD for inviting us to this event. Angola welcomes the work undertaken by the authors and commends them for this book as a contribution to help African countries in their efforts to restrain capital flights in all its forms and dimensions. In particular, we are looking to issues related to capital acquired illicitly, as well as transferred through illicit means, which are destructive elements to the economic development of affected countries. These practices discourage FDI, undermine government effort to achieve the SDGs, in particular SDG 1 and poverty, to and hunger and 10 reduce inequalities. This is an occasion to emphasize the importance of aligning the principles, aspirations and objectives of 23rd agenda with United Nations Convention Against Corruption, in particular SDG 16. We are pleased to share with you that the fight against corruption and impunity as an irreversible, irreversible way forward was assumed as a national priority by the government of Angola. Therefore, the country maintains a close connection with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC, and would like to consolidate and deepen it even more. As a matter of fact, in 2021, the Attorney General's Office, in partnership with UNODC, launched a project entitled Supporting the National System for Confiscation of Assets in Angola, PRORIACT, with a focus on financial wealth investigations. Excellencies, as part of its efforts to combat corruption and related issues, such as illegal capital flights, illicit financial flows, money laundering, tax evasion, and theft of public assets from 2017, Angola reinforced the existing and created several new legal frameworks for, for criminal and civil accountability. Accordingly, in line with the governance program to combat corruption in Angola for the period 2017-2022, the government adopt enhanced disciplinary measures to discourage, prosecute, and punish acts of corruption that harm the state and the country's overall interests. In 2018, it established the Directorate for Combating Crimes of Corruption which is centralized, which is a centralized body for the investigation of such cases. Moreover, in 2018, the law 15-18 of 26 December, law on coercive repatriation and extending loss of assets, established the National Service for the Recovery of Assets, CENRA, aimed at identifying, locating, and seizing financial and non-financial public assets that have been illegally appropriated, whether in Angola or abroad. According to this institution, around US 50 billion worth of assets are under investigation. Of the 50 billion, around 13 have already been seized. About half outside Angola and 5.3 billion have already been definitively recovered in favor 
of the state. Furthermore, with support from the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, the country created a strategic plan for preventing and combating corruption, 2018-2022, that serves as a guide for the actions which Angola will undertake to fight corruption, whose main pillars are prevention, combating pursuit and recovery of assets, and building institutional capacity. One of the challenges of all this process is the shortage of staff, of course. Nevertheless, the National Institute of Legal Studies will start a course that we this year and and we will start a course this year and the expectation is that in 2024 about 100 magistrates will join the state prosecutors in the same manner 450 vacancies are expected to be filled soon at the technical level. Looking specific, specifically at the observations reflected in the book, we couldn't agree more when the authors state that, and I quote, addressing the problem of capital flight and related issues requires national and global efforts with a high level of coordination, end of quote. In our case, without efficient and effective multilateral cooperation and with intervention of the United Nations system, the African Union and the Southern African Development Community, SADC, it will be very difficult to succeed. In this context, we believe that in order to curb capital flights in Africa in a rigorous and effective manner, it is crucial that we keep strengthening our cooperation to take the necessary coordinated actions nationally, regionally, and inter internationally to reinforce our economic, financial, and legal governance institutions and mechanisms. I thank you very much for your attention. Ambassador, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I think the, the emphasis on, you know, what we can do as a system to, to address, as, as, as Leonce and you both said, is a huge, I mean, we're talking, this is a significant resources that need to be recovered by a country like Angola to meet its development goals. So, so the role of the system is imperative in, in that context. I think, I think that's clear. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, contribution is, I think someone probably you don't need, does, doesn't need a lot of introduction is uh, Rob Davis, um, who was formerly the Minister of Trade and Industry for South Africa, recently retired, happily retired, I believe, Rob is the word, um, a self a self described old age pensioner is is how he likes to be described at least in the past and uh, but but if if anyone's read his autobiography and which i would recommend uh, which is called towards a, a new deal um, i don't think retirement really is probably the right way to describe what what he's doing rob has an extensive uh, history of, of as a development economist and teaching and practicing uh, well before he, he joined the, the government of, 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 of South Africa. Um, again, Rob's biography is available on, the, on our um, website. Rob, um, welcome. You, know, you have uh, 10, to 10, 10 minutes or so for your comments. No, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, it was uh, only this morning that I picked up the invitation to participate and I had to run around and try to reorganize my day and uh, at least find some time to at least skim uh, this book. 
And actually, I'm very glad that I did, because I think that this is an excellent piece of work around, about a very, very important topic. Um, when I think about my own understanding of this, I think there's been a, a couple of uh, important uh, contributions on this topic that have come before. Um, that was the 2011 African Union UNCTAD uh, investigation led by our former president, Targo Mbeki. Uh, then there was the uh, 2020 UNCTAD Economic Development in Africa report tackling illicit financial flows. And now there's this work, uh, which have attempted to, to quantify the extent. And I think uh, as a result of those three combined, I don't think anybody can, can deny that the illicit flows of capital from Africa dwarf either overseas development assistance or foreign direct investment. And this particular volume is telling us that they dwarf both of those together. So this is actually a massive, massive issue. Uh, if we didn't have uh, this uh, capital flow, the continent of Africa wouldn't be highly indebted uh, and at the uh, mercy uh, of, uh, of creditors. Now, um, they tell us in the book that in the make-believe world of, uh, I think, neoliberal economics, uh, this shouldn't be the case because the market would self-correct and everything. But they're telling us that there's a number of choke points and at all in these choke points, uh, those who are controlling them are extracting ex excessive profits. And what I want to do, I want to suggest also by looking at a little bit about the South African chapter, is that I think that what we've seen here is a, a, a normalization in a world of financialized capitalism of uh, actually this looting that's going on. I mean, uh, you know, Lenin, when he spoke about imperialism, he talked about imperialism as being the export of capital. I don't think he quite un uh, meant it to be uh, that the largest part of the export of capital would be coming from the underdeveloped world to the developed world rather than the other way around. Uh, and um, if I could turn to the, uh, the case of South Africa and the chapter that's done there, uh, I think that the point I'd want to make, building on what I said earlier about this normalized uh, practices of financialized capital, is that if you take the, the case of the, the Gupta family, which is explored in that chapter, and obviously uh, explored much more uh, in the reports of the, of the uh, of State Capture Commission, which is now reporting, uh, what is, is, is striking is that uh, among the enablers that the, uh, that the, the chapter speaks about are banks, accountants, firms, consultancies, and among them, uh, the leading so-called respectable uh, and, and, and uh, front players uh, in all of these. I, I mean, some of the names were mentioned, I'm not going to mention them, but these are supposedly uh, reputable companies. And these were prepared to put their services at the command of um, uh, essentially a criminal enterprise, a criminal enterprise that was involved in outright right theft and money laundering. Now, what I, I think is striking is that the figures that they give for uh, the capital flows from South Africa, uh, the figure, the cumulative figure for uh, the outflows from 1995 to 2018, uh, they put it 185.5 million. And they say that the largest part of this is trade misinvoicing, which was at that point, at that, during that period, $133.5 billion. So the lion's share of this is, is not um, outright theft and, and, and of, of the sort of the Guptas, but it's actually trade misinvoicing. And now I think that over, over time, uh, I have become aware, others have become aware that there was a huge discrepancy between what some of our major uh, trading partners importing mineral products were declaring as the value of the products they were importing from South Africa and the declared value of those products as exports uh, in our figures. So a huge disparity. And uh, from time to time, uh, there, was, there were indications that this uh, kind of, uh, of, of misinvoicing uh, was characteristic of large parts of the South African mining exports, mineral product exports. Now, this must be so uh, from the figures that are given. So what we're talking about is we're not talking about 
um, a few rogue elements who've come in from India and uh, managed to ingratiate themselves with some political leaders uh, in our country. We're talking about a practice which is probably quite pervasive uh, within um, the practices of the, of the mining industry uh, in, in our country. And the question that arises is that if these apparently respectable institutions were prepared to put their services at the, at the behest of, 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 of the Gupta family, how much more are they doing it uh, in, in, in relation to, uh, to, to, to uh, these uh, uh, other supposedly more normalized and more respectable players? So I think what I want to say is that I think it will be good is the normalization in this world of financialization of these kinds of practices. And that I think is what we, we're up against. Now, the other thing which I think was very important in the South African chapter was the, the, the pointing out that the uh, policy of liberalization, liberalization of uh, exchange controls, liberalization uh, of uh, investment regimes and all of this, um, they were undertaken in the name of attracting foreign direct investment, but actually uh, accelerated the flight of capital. I mean, I think what the very often the narrative in, in, in trying to sell some of these measures was that if you liberalize and you allow someone to take their capital and, 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 and list abroad and take their capital out, uh, that will create more confidence for capital to come in. Well, you, you get what you see. Uh, you get the capital outflows, but not necessarily uh, the capital inflows. So I think that this, this, these policies of, of liberalization, which were, which were embraced in our country, uh, have clearly not worked. And that raises the key question. What then, are we, what then needs to be done? And I think that uh, Jim Boyce made a, a number of important points, but he was talking mostly <clears throat> about what needs to happen in the recipient countries, uh, the developed world, what the developed world needs to do. And I think he's also pointed out, and it was pointed out in the book uh, more strongly, that for every measure that is introduced, there's a huge lobby and effort uh, to counter this. And that the uh, industries that are, are, are doing this lobby are actually quite powerful in the, in the economy and quite powerful uh, in terms of their political influence in the developed world. I think that, 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 that this issue was not unknown, as I said already, in South Africa. And quite a lot of reliance was placed on the OECD. Now, I think that, you know, we're not members of the OECD. None of the three countries that are, that are cited as, as examples are, are members of the OECD. And I think, to, uh, you know, whatever it may have done, and I think there's some uh, positive steps that have been taken by the OECD, there's obviously a need for a much stronger multilateral effort to try to, 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 uh, to grapple with this issue. And I suggest that this is the kind of uh, work that maybe Aung Chad wants to do. Uh, how do we, we come up with, uh, with, 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 with a series of provisions and rules uh, even at multilateral level? And I say rules at multilateral level because I just want to mention one thing that um, the um, trade facilitation agreement in the WTO, when this was being negotiated, one of the things that we proposed precisely to deal with this issue of misinvoicing was that we would have the right to request of a country of origin or of destination of our imports or exports, we'd have the right to request the information about the declared value of imports or exports uh, from that country. Uh, and I think that, and this was this was rejected. This was rejected flat. Uh, and um, I think that, that this kind of measure would at least equip, because I think this is something that we need to talk about as well. How can we reinforce the actions taken by countries themselves, as well as uh, a, a, in, in, in the countries uh, to which uh, the capital is exported? Uh, because I think that we have the, the biggest interest in, 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 in dealing with this matter. And I want to just say, uh, you know, at one stage in my career, I was the chair of the uh, Parliamentary Committee on Finance. And every year we used to get presented with a, with a, a tax amendment bill. And the tax amendment bill was, most of it, was about uh, some uh, anti-avoidance measure, uh, about trying to deal with uh, uh, the, um, uh, whatever had been discovered in terms of uh, uh, intercompany transfers and all sorts of things. And it was complicated, uh, 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 very de detailed and difficult uh, provisions that were being, were being dealt with. And I had the feeling all the time, and I mentioned it, that we were, we were kind of chasing yesterday's scheme as tomorrow's scheme was being hatched. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were, you know, acting after the event. 
And um, I was thinking that, and I suggested this, I, I, well, first of all, I asked, how many people are there in government that are working on, on this kind of issue? And they said about 100 in South Africa. And I said, how many people work for one of these firms that advise clients on ways to structure their tax affairs so that they can actually base a road and profit shift? And the answer was more than that in any one of them, and there's several of them. And so it's an uneven struggle. So I said, well, why can't we just do something like put in place uh, a presumption uh, that if your tax, if your, you, you know, your turnover uh, is not less than it was last year, you can't be presumed to pay less tax than you did last year. And if you want to come and argue that, the onus is on you to prove it, not for us to discover it. And I think that there are a few things like that that maybe uh, are, are, are worth uh, thinking about. Also, you know, going a bit further, um, uh, I, uh, you know, um, just to, to, to add one point, um, um, Leonsi said, well, he wasn't sure whether South Africa was the most uh, unequal society in the world. Well, just today, uh, the World Bank says we are. So um, uh, they've issued a report saying we are based on the, on the Gini coefficient. But I, I think that, that, that the, 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 um, the questions of, 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 of trying to follow uh, trails uh, extradition of the Guptas, even though there's a, a, um, a, a, a uh, Interpol red notice, not going well. Uh, reclaiming any of these resources, not going well. Uh, and so I think that, um, you know, uh, these, are, these are all issues uh, at stake. And, and so I think that um, uh, really what we, 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 we need to, to come to terms with is, 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 is what I think this book is telling us, is this kind of normalization of, these, of this kind of practice through the norms and standards and practices uh, of uh, financialized capitalism. And I think that, that it's, it's nothing less than that, uh, but um, I, I also think that maybe we, 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 we need to think uh, of um, a series of actions at different levels uh, that can uh, address and deal with this problem. Because of course, if we did manage to deal with it, we wouldn't have a debt problem. Uh, and uh, we'd have many more resources uh, for development than we currently have. Thank you very much. Great, Thank, thanks, Rob. And I'm going to come back to the misinvoicing question and, and Jean Vier, because, because as, as you said, the work that was done in UNCTAD was an important contribution to that. And my colleague Jean Vier will say something about that, I think, in a second. But, I, but Nicholas Shackson has joined us, um, one of the authors of the book. So let me let me give the floor to, to, to Nick and, and welcome and thanks thanks for joining us, uh, Nick. Uh, maybe to pick up particularly on Rob's book, because you know, and I think Jim mentioned at the beginning, you know, your book on, and I should say that Nick is a, an author and a, and a journalist and a researcher who has been working on these issues for a long time. Many of you probably know his book on, on Tax Havens, Treasure Island, which was, I think, a seminal contribution to that discussion well over a decade ago. But, but of course, more recently, your book on the finance curse and on the systemic uh, nature of this challenge uh and and the and the web of institutions that as rob said are, are, are very much part of this story and and obviously your your chapter is on on the specific case of uh, angola so perhaps you could link link those two aspects of of, of this of, of this issue in, in what you have to say thanks richard yeah and i apologize uh for having uh had to come to this a little bit late. Um, I will be brief because uh, I'm, I'm sure time is, is running short. I think it's very important to link the concept of the finance curse with um, uh, what I've been writing about in the Angola report, what other, others have been writing about in this book, and um, what many of you, I think, will have been uh, grappling with uh, professionally for a long time. Now, this touches on the question of political will, this all important question of political will. How do we get to do something about what's going on? I think it's easy for, um, you know, I'm sitting in Germany, I'm British, us in the West to, uh, sorry, I'm just going to move that because I think I'm getting some visual interference. It's easy for us in the West to sit and kind of pontificate about what people in Africa, for example, should be doing with X, Y, Z, with uh, various policies. Um, I think it's crucial to turn to the question of what we in the West can do practically ourselves 
um, to tackle the inflows. Um, and this is something that's been touched on. And I think the finance curse uh, analysis plays a really important role here because the political problem for us in the West is, I, I think most people, most citizens of the UK or Germany or France or wherever, will take a view that, okay, we don't like Africa being looted. We don't like the money being stashed in tax havens. We don't like crime. We don't like all of this stuff. But it brings, we see the money flowing into our economy, particularly the United Kingdom with the city of London. We see this dirty money coming in. We see this money from Russia. We see this money from Africa. We see this money from other places. And it's been making some of our people rich and that we've just this ge general sort of vague idea that there's going to be some sort of trickle down and therefore we'll be better off in our pockets, us in the UK, talking as a British person, we will be better off in our pockets. So you've got this kind of conflicting problem you have on the one hand, people don't like, you know, the bad stuff, don't like all this capital flight, but on the other hand, well, say it quietly, but we like the money. Uh, the finance curse is, is um, actually draws on um, a lot of, relatively new academic literature since the global financial crisis that looks at the role that financial se sectors play in our own economies. Um, uh, and before the global financial crisis, I think there was a standard line in sort of finance literature that more finance was good for you. You know, if your financial sector grew bigger, your country would be rich richer, your citizens would be, would be better off. And inflows of dirty money would, would have been a component of that. Um, there are other reasons why financial sectors grow. After the <coughs> excuse me, after the financial global financial crisis, you started seeing a new wave of literature that emerged that not only warned of the dangers of too much um, reliance on finance for uh, um, you know the purposes of crisis and risks and so on, but it, it became a more sort of there's a, there's a more sort of embedded. Um, uh, set of research now, which I liked, I can describe it um, using two kinds of two varieties of food to, to, to illustrate it. Um, the first, the first is the fried egg. And the fried egg tells us, um, it, 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 picture that and, and the yolk in the middle is the useful, we all need finance. It provides all sorts of useful services. Every economy needs a financial sector. And that's the yolk. That's the useful stuff that is finance serving as an intermediary that supports activities going on in other parts of the economy. Um, outside the yolk, though, you get the, the white, maybe it should be green, some nasty color. Um, and that's where finance grows beyond these use of these useful roles. And it starts doing other things. It starts doing much more predatory things, um, extracting money from, from the rest of the economy, um, extracting money from you know, uh, ordinary citizens in Tanzania or wherever uh, uh, through the looting mechanism. And so, it becomes this very so you have you know good finance and bad finance and the very simple message of the finance curse is um, shrink finance for prosperity in other words we want to get rid of the bad finance shrink it down to this useful core and that will help us in the west that will make us richer there's a kind of paradox in there um, which is linked to the paradox of poverty from plenty which is known as the resource curse which is um what oil producing countries, mineral producing country, countries suffer. Too much, um, in this case, it's not oil, it's finance. Um, and too much finance is bad for you. Now, the second uh, piece of food that I would like to use to illustrate this is the banana. And that is a, a number of graphs that have been produced in the academic literature now, which basically have the same banana shape. And that the graph plots um, uh, size of a financial sector there's various different measures of size of a financial sector uh, levels of financial development on the x-axis and on the y-axis axis a uh, some measure of, of uh, economic growth and the banana shape it starts uh when you have very little finance more finance will help your economy develop. You need more, you need to have a properly functioning financial system. So you develop it, but you get to a kind of optimal point in this banana shaped curve where the financial sector is the right kind of size. Um, this, uh, some studies have found this level to be roughly when um, private credit is about worth about 100% of GDP. Um, and then if you keep growing beyond that, it starts to harm growth. So more finance, again, this paradox, more finance makes you poorer. Um, uh, and it's, it, 
it's obviously a very complicated picture. This banana graph is a very simplified version of what's going on in the world, and every country is different, of course. But um, I think it is uh, it is a very powerful uh, uh, sort of underpinning for the idea that we need to reduce the power of finance in, in our economies. And I think from a political perspective, within the receiving countries that are receiving capital flight, it is a mechanism by which we can persuade voting populations to crack down on this kind of stuff. Um, inflows of dirty money, I think now is obviously a very critical moment, a very important moment where a lot of people are waking up to the sort of national security implications of all these inflows of money. That is a, a democratic, a, a political national security counterpart to the economic arguments that have been made for some time. And I think if we start um, trying to, uh, you know, I call this analysis the finance curse analysis, uh, analysis in the academic literature. People often return, re refer to the too much finance uh, strand of literature. But I think this is a very powerful way um, to start to change the paradigm by which we are um, by which we are talking about these things. And we need to uh, and to start showing voting populations and politicians and, and many others that um, more finance is going to be is going to harm us. It will not only harm the outflow countries, but it harms the inflow countries too. So I think there's a lot of political possibility here for changing um, what's going on. And it's something that I'm continuing to work on, but I, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Nick, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, I do wholeheartedly recommend people to look at The Finance Curse. I think it's a great book. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'll, go, I'll go back to, um, we've got two more dis discussants and, and, and we haven't got a lot of time left. Let me go back to um, Jean Vier Mike, and, and pick up maybe Jean Vier on the issue of mis, uh, 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 misinvoicing because you did important work on that. Uh, Jean Vier uh, Nukurunzia, Nukurunziza is our officer in charge of the commodities branch in UNCTAD, but has worked extensively on uh, African uh, policy challenges, uh, both in UNCTAD and, and, and previously at the United Nations Economic uh, Commission for uh, for Africa. Uh, Jean Vier, do you want to pick up on that issue? Is Jean Vier on? If he is, I can't, is he on the? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. Jean Vier has left, and unfortunately. So, so I will I will come to our final discussant, um, and it's a pleasure to to welcome Atia Waris, who is uh, the UN independent expert on foreign debt and human rights, and and I think has worked extensively on on these kinds of issues. Atia uh, Atia is a lecturer at the University of a, a lecturer of law. At the University of Ni Nairobi, and specialising in particular, I think, on fiscal fiscal law and and, and related development issues. Um, so it would be great to just to hear your wrap up, if you like, of what you what you've been listening to. I know it speaks directly to the kind of work that you're doing as the as the um, independent expert. So so it would be great to hear your comments. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I haven't yet read the book, but I'm certainly looking forward to, to doing so. I, I kept reflecting over the past 17 years of my work, a lot less longer than everybody else in the room. So I'm feeling very young right now. Um, but in, in 2005, when I first started working on issues of the fiscal state, I remember looking at the fact that human beings at the bottom were struggling seriously with the economic repercussions of all the rules and regulations that everyone has talked about as sometimes systematic and, and sometimes ad hoc, I think. And I remember working on my first book, which was Tax and Development, and the struggle to get data was incredible. And so a book like this is such a welcome addition uh, to the huge amount of gaps in knowledge and information that are already there. But I'm also very much struck by the way forward. Uh, 2019, I, I did my second book on financing African, and I too was trying to unpack the, the enablers in the system. And it's a, it's a real struggle to, to get them and to get data to back them up. And, and then in comes this book, which I think is, is so wonderful. And, and 
I keep thinking, well, yes, some things are systematic, some things are structural, but we have to always remember that the, the human being is at the center of these acts. And they're very much personal decisions that people are making. And this is where I think both human rights and the SDGs now become even more important when you have data like this in context. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of us talk about um, scarcity, but, but I wonder if if this is not a world of plenty and that the reason why the battles are not being won are because those who are in power don't see the pressure point as much as I think they, they could, they should, or they would um, because the data has been, has been so difficult to get to grapple with. Uh, there is a, an Ethiopian proverb that says that you only look down the well when the, when the water has run dry. And I don't know, maybe some of us are seeing that the water is running dry and some seem to think the water is still there and are not reacting uh, as much as they could or should have. But I want to close with just a uh, way forward. Uh, there are two things that my, my mandate is going to be working on between this year and next year, which I think are very important and very much connected to the, the book. The first is that the, the Human Rights Council have asked me to look into draft guidelines on the repatriation of state assets. So the capital that has flown out and how to get, get it back in. And the second is that in October of this year, I will be submitting a report on the uh, calls around a multilateral tax body. And, and I already heard uh, conversation around issues of multilateralism and the need to put more effort behind it. So uh, delighted to see the book, very much looking forward to reading it. And uh, please do engage with my mandate. Uh, because I see a lot of connections. And this is for, of course, uh, Leon Senbois. I've been looking forward to submissions from you. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, um, Atia. Uh, I think, Jean-Vier, are you, are, you are you on now? I think Jean-Vier is on. At least he, he sent me a message to say that he's here, but I don't. Yeah, he's he's here. I, would, I just text him. He said he's here. I does he have the? If you don't put him a panelist, he won't be able to talk. Yeah, I, he's not on my list, uh, Leon's. Maybe maybe he can join in a second. I, I mean, there's, we've had a huge number of questions, of course, and I, there's no way I can. I can actually go through them in the time we have left anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna throw a couple out really to, to you and Jim by way of comments and questions from, from I think a lot of the, I think a lot of what has been said um, does, does answer uh, the questions. One, I think, which I think is an important one, which for this and, and for our work as well, more generally about, about whether capital, con do capital controls work in this kind of highly financialized world that we operate in? And, and, and if, they, if, if they don't, or if they are too leaky a, a tool, what do we have to do to kind of strengthen the use of capital controls as part of the policy toolkit that is required to, to, to deal with both, both capital controls at both ends of that, both as recipient and uh, countries and 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 delivering countries. Uh, I, I think it's an important question about what role capital con controls can play in this. And I, I just wonder, Leon and Jim, what what thoughts you had on that? Uh, thanks, Richard. Again, thanks to uh, all the commentators who have uh, given us lots of uh, food for thought. Um, Ambassador from uh, from Angola. Excellent. I. Uh, to hear about what the government is, 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 is trying to do to uh, tackle this problem. Because um, as, I, as, I, as many people have worked in this area will, will, let, will tell you, uh, often it's, conf it's, it's uh, frustrating when the reaction from government policymakers is denial, that there is no problem, that you are looking the wrong side, you're looking at the wrong, wrong ideas, you're looking at the wrong numbers. And uh, instead of, trying to see what can be done. It's not a simple issue, but I think denying it only delays and worsens the, worsens the, the problem. So I'm very, very um, uh, happy to see what the government of Angola is, 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 is trying to do. Uh, 
And for Rob, of course, I always wish I could have uh, uh, 30 minutes of uh, tea and coffee with Rob because the wealth of, uh, of knowledge of, on the economy of South Africa and global, globally uh, generally. I think he pointed to a, a very structural issue, which is this issue of normalization of financial crime, OK? It's, it's, the, it's the, the notion that we should accept that this is how things are done. In fact, there are, there are people who reacted, who always react to, to our work as saying that, Leon, this is how the market works. Don't try to, to, to ask where the cocoa from Cote d'Ivoire goes from Abidjan to whatever the destination, because that's how the market works. These secret uh, trading hubs, that's what facilitate trade. Um, I have had also, uh, uh, pushback from countries which say, who say you are not you are using the wrong uh, the wrong data, but the data we use is official data which is supplied by by the, by the government. So um, I think the the as as Rob said, if you look at the, the, the all those reports which have been proposed, uh, produced by the UN independent agencies and so on, they can not all be looking in the wrong place. I mean something is really really wrong, and it's it's important that we. We join our effort to 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 uh, address that. Um, to before I, I, I answer the question by uh, by uh, Richard, which is a fundamental question about how do you deal with uh, with capital flight and what uh, do normal policies like regulations and control work? I want to to, to acknowledge a, a, a very important question raised by uh, somebody who knows these areas this area very very well uh dick uh Foslon from uh, aidc in cape town uh he asked specifically the issue of um mining corporations <clears throat> and their uh, manipulation of their profits shifting profits offshore and claiming that they really don't have money to pay the workers so it, it in addition to talking about uh, shifting profits away, base erosion, there is the issue also of wage erosion because what the companies are saying is that they are paying up to what they can they can based on the on the on the profits they make. But if you're shifting your profits abroad, then of course you have no profit to show to pay to pay to pay the workers. So which means that. This issue of capital flight is, uh, is very broad. In, uh, it affects not, not only treasuries that are losing the money, but also the workers that are working for free in, in companies that are making a lot of money. It's, it's, it's almost embarrassing when you hear that mega corporations have not paid taxes and you and I, everybody on the call, are paying our taxes every, every, every year. Um, but because they can manipulate their, their finances, they, they, don't, they don't pay in, in taxes. Um, I have a, 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 a former, a, an old friend of mine, Jen Nindorera from Burundi, who, who is asking the same question that, that Richard is, is asking, how do you enforce the rules? Because even if you put capital controls, you have to be able to enforce them. You have to have the capacity to enforce them. And Rob Davis made a very, a very important, a, a chilling point about how the capacity of state agencies compare with the humongous capacity of the companies they are trying to control. Um, you try to audit a company that has millions and I mean dozens and dozens of accountants, finance engineers, and so on, and you have only two tax accountants in the in the in in in, the, in your department. It's impossible to 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 uh, to have a level playing field. So one issue is that. Uh, policies like capital controls, of course, are important because you want to protect the economy from uh, 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 volatile and uh, 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 rent-seeking capital that, <clears throat> that comes in the country and exit uh, anytime there's a, there's a, a sense of risk. But, <clears throat> but the problem is that uh, we're talking about capital that uh, uh, is being transferred through illicit mechanisms under the ground, behind the, 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 uh, the, the, the normal regulations, and also benefiting from weak institutions, which are weakened partly because of illicit financial flows, because the, the, the orchestrators of financial flows corrode institutions for their benefit so that it is easier to, 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 uh, to, move, the, to move the money. So 
the capital controls will um, help regulate normal legitimate capital flows, but they will not help regulate stolen money, money that people steal and are going to do everything to hide to hide away. The other uh, reason why capital controls have been ineffective is what uh, Nick is talking about, which is what's being done at the, in the destination countries, because we can press African governments to be as aggressive on capital controls, on corruption, uh, anti-corruption as Angola is, is trying to do. But if, the, if their trading partners, their financial, financial development partners are not doing the same to discipline their banks and their corporations, Angola cannot, cannot succeed if it is not helped by countries in the West to ask questions about money coming from Angola and make sure that the money coming from Angola to their banks is clean, that their companies are paying taxes in Angola. And that's the only way that African countries can, is going to make, to, make to, to, to move ahead. Jim maybe may have a few, and, and Nick may have a few things to add. I'm, I'm, I think the, the, the difficulty is that we're kind of over time, and I, and I want to give Janvier, I, I, do, I have to give Janvier the, uh, the floor because because as, as you've said, I mean, he, he's been responsible for some of the seminal work that UNCAD has contributed on, on this challenge. So I, I'm, I'm gonna give you the floor, jean Vier. Maybe we can squeeze a little bit of last comments from Jim and Nick at the end of that. But jean Vier, could, could you just give us your thoughts really from, from the UNCAD perspective on this? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> now I hope you can hear me, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was actually here, just I had used the wrong link. And <laughs> yeah, I didn't come use the link uh, of uh, panelist link. Now, I, would ju I just want to say a couple of things, really. The one thing I wanted to say is that this whole issue of capital flat is shrouded in secrecy. So the capital that goes is not just exposed uh, to the public. So when it is shrouded in secrecy, and people do research, try to find out what are the fundamentals and they use what they can get hold of. Uh, it's difficult to say that, uh, you know, now to come and criticize them that, you know, they didn't use the right data. I think Leon alluded to this point. Uh, so that's the reason why for me, any step towards establishing the truth, towards getting to the truth, is really a very good step. And uh, this is where I salute this book because uh, it's not just uh, trying to show the extent of the, the problem, but it's also trying now to explain the mechanisms because that is where uh, information had been uh, scanty. The mechanisms, who is involved, where, uh, what type, and then how much. So I think this is where uh, uh, the book is really, is really great. The second thing I want to say is that there are vested interests, very strong vested interests in this area. And this is where I would like to share the experience when we did uh, this work, actually with Leons, uh, when we did this UNCTAD work, uh, we got a lot of pushback. So there are uh, entities out there who don't want the truth, let me say, to be known. So we need to be aware of this. So we got very, very strong pushbacks. And what surprised me actually was even within my own organization, a very senior person here uh, approached me and told me, you know, uh, what you did is not really, I mean, he almost says rubbish. He said, uh, I have asked my uh, people uh, who he considered to be more knowledgeable, of course. They said that global capital flight is just about $4 billion. Four billion dollars. So I just smiled wryly and left. Uh, I had nothing to say. But I think now the truth is coming out. Okay. Now the UN has SDG 16, which is acknowledging the UN, the organization for which we we both work. My senior colleague and myself has acknowledged it's a big problem. Uh, the world community now uh, really acknowledges this, aided in part by uh, global scandals like the Panama Papers that we didn't really talk about here and other scandals like the recent uh, scandal here involving uh, a, big, a big bank here in Switzerland. 
And uh, I immediately thought about Jim, actually, when this scandal, when I learned of this scandal, because Jim did a paper in 1988 on capital flight in the Philippines, okay? And some prominent names from the Philippines were among uh, the, the, the people who were involved with, uh, with this bank. So I think things are moving, but really now, just to conclude, I think because I know we don't, I, there is much I could say, but I, I know we don't have much time. I think to conclude really the UN as an organization, I think we should take this issue seriously and try to convene, you know, try to bring together all these entities, all these stakeholders. I know it's not necessarily easy, but it's only the UN who can do it, if it can be done. So bring countries, I mean, origin countries, civil society in those countries, civil society in, uh, uh, in the countries where the money is, uh, private sector, I'm talking about banks, commodity trading companies, uh, get them together and really let, it, let them talk to each other. Because if we don't succeed in doing this, everyone will stay in his corner uh, trying to deny that this problem actually exists. The academics will keep writing their books and reports, but not, not much will happen. And government will just close their eyes because probably they are benefiting from uh, this capital flight. So I think we need something like that. I mean, that's really the point I wanted to end on, even though the other elements, I had the written text, but uh, the other elements, uh, I leave them. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks very much. Can I maybe can I Jim? Can I give you the, la the last word? Sure. Well, let me thank everybody for um, for coming to, uh, to to this launch event, and particularly thank our our terrific discussants, whose remarks I I really appreciate, and all the hard work that you folks at UNCTAD have done both to set up this, this event and over the years on this issue, um, particularly uh, Jean Vier's work on uh, trade uh, statistics has been very valuable. Um, let me just as quickly as I can pick up a couple threads uh, to wrap up, including um, one or two that came out of the questions I was able to see in the chats. Um, one question asked about uh, beneficial ownership rules. And um, I think that is a very important issue that those are rules that uh, prevent anonymity uh, via shell companies and who actually owns uh, assets. And it's um, interesting to note, uh, this is an example of progress being made, but progress is slow. Uh, it takes time. But there is progress that's, that's happened over the many years that I've been working on these issues now. And a recent example of that is that in uh, January last year, 2021, uh, the US um, passed uh, something called the Corporate Transparency Act, which bans anonymous shell companies uh, from owning corporations. Uh, in the United States. That's a, a big upgrade in terms of anti-money laundering legislation in this country. However, uh, that only applies to corporations, not to trusts, which are the financial instruments that are uh, purveyed by uh, the state of South Dakota, um, not to uh, real estate, uh, which is a gigantic uh, source of hidden wealth offshore, uh, not to private equity funds or hedge funds. So these are loopholes. Now, somebody asked, well, are these weak rules an accident or are they deliberate? They are deliberate. Of course, you don't get weak rules like this uh, accidentally. It's not just nobody was paying attention. It's somebody was paying a lot of attention. They wanted the rules uh, to be weak. So somebody in the questions asked, and this is you know, the closing thing, what do we do to prevent uh, this? Well, I think um, we need to keep the pressure on, as several people have said. And, and to uh, pick up on Rob's uh, phrase of normalization, I think it's true that a lot of illicit activity, illicit financial flows included, have been normalized over the years, partly as a result of the kind of anything goes liberalization era, but partly also as a result of the growing inequality uh, in the world economy, which spills over into uh, how the uh, political systems 
uh, operate. And I think what we need to do is build a transnational alliance of people across the world. And if UNCTAD can help to play a leadership role in this respect, that would be uh, terrific uh, to fight against the transnational plunder networks, which are victimizing people at home and abroad. Um, I think we need to abnormalize these activities that have been normalized, including criminalize uh, many of the activities and penalize them. And it's a slow process. This is not something where you snap your fingers and ah, the problem's been solved. You know, one, one piece of legislation is signed or whatever. No, it's a long concerted struggle. But over the years, progress has definitely been made. When I first started working on these issues, uh, about uh, 30 years ago now, more than 30 years in the Philippines. Um, this was a topic that was hardly even discussed in polite company. Uh, it was considered to be embarrassing. Uh, too many powerful people would be offended if you discuss these things. Now we're having these kinds of open discussions and that's progress. Uh, there's been a lot of effort made to move things forward. And of course, it's frustrating that it doesn't happen faster, but we have to recognize that there is this arc of history and we are potentially on the winning side if we continue uh, to, to struggle on these issues. So what I want to encourage everyone to do, uh, apart from thanking you and, and hoping that you'll somehow manage to get our book, there will be a paperback edition that'll be more affordable um, coming out uh, hopefully in a year or so. But, um, but apart from those things, the most important thing for you to do is to keep working on these issues, uh, not to be afraid to raise them uh, publicly and to be part of the solution, which is gonna require efforts from all of us. Thank you all very much. Thank you uh, very much, Jim. It's a, I think it's an appropriate way to end what is a great, has been a great conversation. La, la lotta continua, I think, is the phrase that Ambassador Izata would recognize. Um, thank, thanks to Leonce and, and to Nick and to uh, Jim, congratulations on the book, and also to to Rob and to Jean Vier and to the ambassador for their for their comments and and for everyone for participating. Clearly, there's a lot of interest in this. We couldn't get through many of the of the questions that were raised uh, during the uh, during the the chat, but clearly there's a lot of interest, and it's encouraging to see that, as as Jim said, I think that this is an issue that is pushing its way back onto the international agenda uh, after many years of neglect. And so uh, thank you all for, for, for participating and, and let me encourage you all to, to, to buy a copy of the book and to look at the work that UNCTAD has done on this issue, which is of course available on our, on our web, website. So good, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Have a, have a great end of the day. Thanks a lot. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think is, Thanks, the, record, is the recording off, Cecilia? Uh, still recording. I can't.